Hello again, this is Classic David with yet another podcast. It's I'm with Curtis here. Hello, Curtis. Hi, David. So, how are you? I'm good. Lots of lots of is happening uh, these days, these weeks in the world. Yeah. Uh, lots Mark of people crazy. nervous all around the world from different reasons. Well, maybe from the same reasons, but lots of people nervous and uh, so uh let's start it today we do the the podcast on wednesday today the timing is a little bit special but the next time i would like to come back to mondays uh but anyway um so we would love to start with the updates so let's begin with s p 500 like usually we start with the updates what happened over the past 10 days our last podcast was on uh, the previous Monday, which was uh, the 7th of March. So from 7th of March, we have gone pretty much sideways, I believe. Pretty much right. sideways, maybe a little bit down. Um, and the last time I also uh, very ambitiously, I draw the circle in a circle because this large circle I have had here for months and this small circle I draw the last time, but it looks mm -hmm. like it's not going to be hit. It would have to be hit like to, like today. And today right. this circle would be hit only if there is some really bad news from the Fed meeting. Nobody expects it though. Right, right. So uh, what do you uh, think about S&P 500 for over the past 10 days? What's your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't own a lot of stocks right now, so I'm not that interested. I mean, more, I'm curious about how it affects Bitcoin. Okay. Um, but clearly, we've had a big sell-off already. Um, a lot of the Ukraine war has been priced in. Mm -hmm. What we, yeah. what we don't know is if things would accelerate, like if, if NATO and Russia started fighting. Obviously, that's a totally different level, and you okay. would see below four thousand easily. I think in that case. Mm -hmm. um, at least for the short term. So um, a lot of the bad news is priced in, I think. So the Fed meeting is today or in Wednesday, on Wednesday in the US. And mm -hmm. it looks like it'll be a 0.25 raise, yeah. not yes. a 0.5, which was my prediction from earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that long ago that people were saying we're going to have eight or nine rate hikes this year and 0.5 oh, yeah. not mm -hmm. happening. Even okay. without Russia, I don't think it would have happened. But um, I think you're going to have um, Powell again being sort of on the fence, but he will probably drop some words about wait and see. And I think the stocks will respond positively. So um, when you have World War III on the edge of possibility, even though it's maybe only, let's say, a 5% chance, there's no way Powell is going to be hawkish in his comments today. I think he's going to be neutral 0.25 raise and he's going to say let's wait and see and i think stocks will like that and they'll say um there is no guarantee that we're not going to have eight rate hikes this year and the markets will probably rally i'm just guessing at that um as soon as you have another surprise to the downside in in russia ukraine you probably see markets sell off again but i think this week will be a good day for the markets they've already sold off a lot and you'll probably get a short-term bounce um off of powell today maybe not but that's yeah, my so guess obviously if there is uh, some bad war war news then my large circle would be hit right i, think I can remove this the short so the it would be like a chemical weapons false flag or an actual chemical weapons attack or uh any any engagement between nato and russian troops um mm -hmm. obviously if they started shelling downtown kiev and there's bodies that would be obviously seen very very negatively but um i think it's understood that russia's winning um and uh, a lot of that's been priced in but well, we'll see yeah i mean from the very beginning it's like uh the ukraine did not have any kind of chance right because uh right. this is and this is still like we have no idea really we can we can watch science fiction movies and we can think it's just science fiction but in truth uh so much of that is reality it's just hidden from the public eyes i'm talking right. about secret weaponry of the superpowers like the us and russia they have the weapons that you know we literally just watch in the science fiction movies. So, 
Right. Uh, it's just now the question how quickly or how slow they can come into some kind of an agreement. Yeah. I mean, Zelensky's, not to get too far into this, but Zelensky's saying things like, you're going to have to carpet bomb and murder all of us before we give up. And it's it's very careless. But uh, uh, this is crazy talk coming from him. I think they're going to reach a peace deal eventually. Uh, eventually, yes. Um, in the next maybe two weeks. I think Russia wants, they want to keep, they don't want to alienate all of the U Ukraine, right? So that, anyways, would be, that would be optimistic. I would be optimistic so. two weeks, but okay, I would also hope so. Yeah. Anyway, the next update, of course, naturally, we're going to do Bitcoin. Now, right. Bitcoin, again, I drew a uh, red circle the last time we had a, a podcast. It does not at the moment look like it's going to be hit. But as you just mentioned, um, if there is bad news uh, from the war, which there could still can be bad news, then yeah. I think we would see the retest. Right. We would see the retest. Other than that, however, if there aren't, then I think that uh, this has uh, bottomed. In my Although opinion. I will add oh, no. to that, and this is maybe for later in the year, but actually, I, I, I maybe I, I misspoke because, of course, uh, NATO, Russia, military kinetic warfare would be horrible, but that is the absolutely worst case scenario. But the other issues that are coming up are going to be things like a U.S. recession, energy oh, prices, yes. oh. inflation. So yes. you could definitely have, uh, even if even if the Russia Ukraine thing calms down, you could still have the knock on effect of all those of the sanctions and energy and Russia becoming a pariah state. All of that could trigger and knock on a massive global recession or a U.S. Okay. recession, and that would would drag down stocks and and crypto. So um, this whole year is going to be risky. I mean, okay. so. Okay, yeah. uh, we will we will surely talk about it because we are going to go to to talk about commodities as well and realities today. Although, uh, you know, what I love to do always is to take step by step. And at the moment, the step that we are at is the 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 conflict, the military conflict. Yes, sir. And at the, at the moment, <laughs> uh, at the moment, uh, that's actually what uh, I think. What does the price action at the very moment is? Yeah. Like. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's holding well. It's holding 38, 39 quite well, isn't it? It's holding pretty pretty well. And if there won't be further bad news, then it's going to hold, in my opinion. It's going to hold also. I've seen so many people bearish, so many people talking about recessions, so many analysts with you know, my favorite thing is to is to uh uh is to to look at the sentiment and I have a. Uh, mm, I, I enjoy going against uh, the large influencers. I, I enjoy right. doing that. And I've seen right. some of them, well, many of them, I've seen pretty bearishly thinking and talking. So that was a very good thing. Uh, anyway, um, so that was be, that would be for Bitcoin. Pretty much sideways since last time. Yeah. Now, uh, what do you want to go to? Gold or the US dollar? Let's do gold. Okay, then gold. This is the chart of the gold. It's so it's off again. Line. Oh my god, the, the gold uh, bugs, the gold bulls must be just, they've lost all their hair by now. They're all bald or gray haired. They must be <laughs> so frustrated. They must be frustrated, but it was still the retest of the top. But and look how I don't... it sold off. It did, but but you know the the way the chart is positioned, there is going okay. to rebound not that far away. So perhaps, yeah. But um, from the but you have to. But everything is happening. If you were a gold bug and you were to make a list of the ten things that would make gold go to ten thousand dollars, what would they be? What would be on your list if you said, oh. okay, for sure, war gold's in going Ukraine. To yeah, war in Ukraine. War in uh, Ukraine. World War Three with Russia. Super high inflation, right? and and yeah, yeah. Um, then the scare of recession because at the moment the scare is here. That's that's uh, realistic. We can talk about recession in the future, but uh, as for yeah. the step we are at, this is a scare of recession right now. What's happening? Yeah. It's not a recession. So recession it's a scare. Uh, how about Iran saying they're going to sell oil in in the Chinese renminbi, or okay. was it Iran? Yeah. Yeah. Or no, Saudi Arabia. No. Saudi Arabia. Which Saudi is Arabia. Yeah. Power, right. I've read some so. I mean, of course, uh, now the US dollar is strengthening. And when we say gold is 1914 on the chart there, that's in US dollars. So there's some, you know, 
if the US dollar was to sell off, obviously it's an inverse of the gold price, uh, right? Oh, yeah. So people need to think that. If And if you do look at gold in, let's say, Egyptian currency or, or it, it, it's a lot of charts, right? Turkish I mean, currency. Or uh, rub- again, that's in not rub- in Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so, but anyways, um, gold in a gold bucks mine should be $5,000 by now. And it's not. It's not higher than it was in 2011. So, uh, let me check. Uh, let me put the monthly candles. We are exa- we're exactly at the yeah. top of 2011, yeah. but that could be uh, 11 could be years. Level. I know, but look yeah. how much money printing has happened since 2011. They yeah, doubled the US true. dollar, right? And and that why hasn't that impacted gold? Yeah, this red line that I've just uh, drew would be yeah. my guess, my best guess that it's going to buy. Uh, oh, you got to bounce you got three percent in eleven years. <laughs> Now, gold <laughs> bugs will say, yeah, but look before that. Look at from 2000 to 2011. I mean, that was a good run, but um, uh, yeah, okay. You know what you got about a what a six x from what 2000. You got more than that from 2000s um, from 225 all the way to almost 2000. Nine x, like six x. Yeah. Six X, yeah. Six X. So I mean that was good, but now we've had eleven years of nothing. Yeah, but this level is even on daily. Oh my god, look at all this. Oh my god, this level is actually sick. This is insane level. I mean, I would be longing uh gold here if I wanted to on this level. But this is not the financial advice, it's just my my technical uh, I, i don't know, know if i take that catching back. catching something you would not be long in gold at 18 well i mean but what what are you going to get on it you're, you're going to get five percent yeah but if you want to keep cash if you want to keep cash uh, then you would perhaps uh, some of that cash also could you know convert it into gold still better than keep right. the cash right. just just Remember depends on gold, how much cash but hmm? didn't uh, gold sold off in the COVID, the March 2020, didn't it? What did it at do in first, March 2020? At yeah. first, okay, let me show, let me show you. Gold yeah. March 2020. Mm-hmm. Well, at first, at first it did, but that's, right. that's literally, I think, what's happening right now. Or maybe no, maybe it's not happening right now, but but at first it sold, but then it rallied, obviously, you know. And, How long and to risk, get, yeah. Risk yeah. off. Yeah. Okay, um, anyway, yep. No, what we're saying, we're talking about a recession coming. So does that mean you should, I think you should be in, if you're thinking recession, you should be in US dollars right now. Okay, I'm not thinking recession. I'm thinking scare of recession right now. The current yeah. step we're in is a scare of recession. I just moment. think US dollar probably has better risk reward than gold right now, but I might be wrong. Okay, so let's have a look at the US dollar. Let's yeah. have a look at the update. So we are going slowly up yeah even from the last but we, we have we have gone sideways from our last uh, so uh-huh. podcast very sideways but you know you see this bounce from my red line again like it looks right. like my line is going to work but remember the red line is monthly that's where i would expect monthly close so i expect right. eventually the dollar to come down but this is a weekly the the blue line is weekly and that's where i would expect weekly close somewhere around right. that area right but it looks like it respects this <laughs> right and then my dear friends in that if that happens then i would then i'm going to say that we are going to see a significant decline But again, Please. not if we got recessions on on the not in a recession. The U.S. dollar is not is going to strengthen. Um, not in in a in a NATO, not in a World War III oh. scenario. U.S. Okay. dollar will strengthen in all of those scenarios in the short term, right? In a short term, which means that it's going to go to my blue line and above, which is yeah. what I have drawn still. So you're not going to see I... U.S. dollar weakness in the next couple of years, I don't think. Ah, oh, I opinion. would disagree. I would disagree with this, but this is again yeah. talking long term. This is talking long term, and uh, let's focus on the current step. But I would disagree with this. I definitely yeah. would. I think we are going to see a lot of. Did you say next years, right? Well, I said I'm just saying, if your thesis is things are are dangerous for the next year or two, right? Uh, with the recession, energy okay. prices, the U.S. dollar is going to be strong in that environment. Okay, so. 
in my... And there's a reason for that, if you'd like me to walk that through. Uh, yes, there are. There are, uh, there are logical reasons for that, yeah, I agree. Although my, ex my personal expectations for the upcoming years would be a significant decline of US dollar. We're based talking on what, though? Based on the technicals. And based technical, on the technical but, technical cycles that I can see here. I guess I'm going on the fun on the fundamentals. Yes, but the fundamental, I mean, you can never really predict the change. I mean, the innovations, they change stuff. They they distort the fundamentals. And you can never this is like when exactly what I'm hearing right now is the same what I've been hearing in 2020 when Corona hit. And it's just people don't really understand what the innovations will done with the situations, like how much it will solve. Like, you know, the fear is one thing, but the, the, the problem solved by the innovations, that's, the, that's another thing. Right. Anyway, as for now, the US dollar okay. goes sideways. So <laughs> over the past 10 days, it went sideways. Uh, let's now have a look at the rubble. <laughs> I think there's no one B, one B. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So you like it when, yeah, you like it this way, not the opposite, the inverted. So it's been going up, actually <laughs> recovering over the past, ever since we had the last. Yes, it recovered. It's a, it recovered and well, rightfully I'm, so, in I'm my opinion. Enough. Rightfully so, because how far uh, it's still down thirty percent or something. Oh, of course, of course, but I think the bottom might be in, and I think then the recovery will depend on how the Russia will handle all the uh, sanctions and the limitations that's come out from that. So mm. uh, that that the recovery, but if they handle it well, which I uh, suspect they will, because. This is not like they are not some kind of, you know, brutes that just decided to go, you know, kill people. They know what they're doing and they have seen this coming. They're prepared kind of for this. So right. uh, I, I think they have the plan, the way out of this. And in the future, we might see some kind of recovery. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. And um now yeah commodities commodities that's going to be spicy that's going to be spicy so commodity number one oil right this is this is all the way from 2000 the chart right here uh it's it's and it's around 100 at the moment but we've seen we've seen the spike to 128 mm -hmm. for oil which is which is uh which is like the top of this structure from 2011 so again i think that the oil might have peaked in my opinion right i think this 130 there's a reasonable chance that this was the peak obviously yeah. the uh the, the demand for oil only ever goes down right the demand only ever goes down this is just a supply problem. This is just the, the, the sanctions, the scare on, on everything. But so inevitably oil is going to go in the few, well, in the upcoming years, in my opinion, it's going to go down a lot. Mm -hmm. It's going to go down tremendously. Like we're talking about, oh my gosh. Well, anyway, so that would be for oil. Watch other, what other commodity do you want to check? Wheat. Wheat is a hot topic because, as you know, Ukraine has, uh, you know, been producing lots of wheat, and so so was Russia. So obviously, the world is afraid. Like, is there going to be enough wheat? So there was a huge spike to four hundred and twenty-five. Right. I think it was yeah, a new all-time high. The, it was a new all-time high. The planting, so the planting season is destroyed this year. Of course, no one's planting farms right now in Ukraine, mm -hmm. so they're going to lose an entire year of crops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Even if the uh, war finishes that's... tomorrow, they've lost the whole year. Yeah. Wow. Well, new all-time high for wheat. Well, that's that says it all. Not to mention next year. I mean, are, are farmers going to go back to building uh, fresh, beautiful farms again if they think tanks are coming again? Or is, is next year going to be hurt as well? And then what about the year after that? What if P Putin decides to attack again? 
do they do people stop investing in their their land and their farms in the Ukraine? At what point does Ukraine get back to uh, normal growth? Is that five years, ten years? Yeah, that nobody knows. Right? Nobody. People really are very short. Anybody they, they think too short term, right? So the risks and the impact of the war go on for five, ten, fifteen years. It's not a. It doesn't matter if the war ends tomorrow. All that matters is there's a risk, and the relationship is damaged. And and you know again, how long will Russia be hated by the world? Well, forever from now on until Putin's left. So that is that twenty years of Russia being like Iraq. Mm, Putin is in the office to the mm -hmm. uh, to twenty thirty two for now. That's the information yeah. I got. So how so... long is the oil pressure going to be? How long is it going to be a problem? I think Russia mm -hmm. has more commodities than the rest of the world combined. Oh yeah. Oh my. And so, some some metals like nickel. And and the West has decided they want to make that country their their worst enemy. How stupid is that? How stupid is that? Yeah, look at the nickel. And nickel you is. You want to demonize? The... You want to demonize the country with the most natural resources in the world? They're idiots. The the truth is that we're living in a cynical world, Curtis. <laughs> in a cynical, cynical world, and very cynical media, very cynical yeah. media. As cynical as you can even imagine. So commodity prices might get affected for 10 years, not 10 weeks. All right. So that was the commodities. I think we've checked just a few just to give you the idea. Then there is, but there are other commodities like copper, iron, ore, but they have not really spiked. Uh, but the last time I checked them. Uh, yeah, I wanted to check realities, realities and the reason why I wanted to check it. First of all, let me show you a chart that I dug up. So, huh? Real estate, like real estate, yes. Re real estate? So this is a chart, median sales price yeah. for new houses sold in the US. And this is all the way from 2012. Right now, we can go, we can go even to the like 1960s. Yeah. And even when you see the, the big picture is going parabolic since 2020 it's going more parabolic it was going prior to 2007 it's going even more parabolic when you see smaller picture from right. 2000 and you can see that it's going more parabolic this is not sustainable it is not sustainable and the, the reality the, no. the the real estate market in china is uh is is being is defaulting and that is going to hit the world that is going to hit the world and realities in my opinion are gonna go down so much i mean i really i i don't want to guess like 50 percent, but i have to guess like unbelievable a lot <laughs> like yeah. from where, where they are right now and yeah. and you know the the bubble always goes the most parabolic just before the bust and even in my town where i am I can see all around, you know, stuff like like the, you know, apartment that costs like two hundred thousand. All of a sudden, it costs three hundred thousand, three hundred thousand fifty. It's absolutely, it, 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 you just you can't believe that this is the reality, right? So, how about Japan? How is the real estate in Japan? Right? Yeah. Uh, so Japan's been in a like a mm -hmm. a declining economy since nineteen ninety. So we're we're thirty two years into a bear market, generally speaking. Now, we're not talking about Tokyo. So I live in Tokyo. Tokyo has been quite good. Um, basically, real estate wow. anywhere oh, okay. in Japan has been falling for 30 years. Uh, in Tokyo, it's been good. It's been OK for the last, let's say, five to 10 years. It's been all right um, because everyone moves to Tokyo. All the businesses are here. But as a country, they have a falling population, right? So you have demand falling. Um, anywhere outside of Tokyo, um, you'd be surprised. You can buy a small <laughs> old house for a hundred thousand <laughs> dollars really? in the countryside near the beach. Uh, most Westerners would be have their mind. Really? It's amazing. There's Never houses just that. sitting empty. Never thought. So, um, <laughs> so maybe we are the future. Japan is maybe. modeling uh, what's going to happen, right? But um, but when you have a falling population, it's it's unusual, yeah. right? Um, you, you don't have that in in the West. All all the countries are, are growing mostly, maybe not Europe, but even Canada, the US are, are growing their population. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's demand for housing. Uh, but Japan's very unusual. It's interesting to look at. 
we have a real estate bubble, we have commodity bubble because we've just been through few commodities that are going to go dra down dramatically, especially mm -hmm. oil, but also other commodities because the China's yeah. it, China yeah. won't be able to be to be uh, won't be buying as much com as many commodities as it was. And when China is the largest buyer of commodities, and because of the the trouble that it's in. We can't really right. see that. that there is, it's not being talked about a lot, right. but it is, it is big what's happening in China and it's going to affect the, 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 the prices of commodities dramatically. Uh, they're going to go down so much as, uh, except for like a risk of commodities like gold, which uh, I suspect are going to go up also based on the chart, it's going to go then up. but. But, yeah, yeah, gold's more like a currency, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, but even after that, once it goes up, I think it's gonna go also decline dramatically. Uh, so yeah. we have we have quite a couple of bubbles. Yeah, and we had the crypto bubble last year. I mean, Bitcoin looks cheap compared to all these other bubbles, in my mind. Bitcoin's uh, still what eight hundred billion? It's tiny. This, disclaimer. I mean, the real sell-off. Right. <laughs> of course, of course, I do. And uh, the market participants, there is a saying that don't that you have you can rely on the market participants uh, regardless of how informed they are. <laughs> you also yeah. can't believe in something unless you're invested in, it, right? Oh yes. Of Otherwise, course, you're yeah. just a believe speculator. Sure. You're, I mean, you're just a you're just a comment like unless you're actually invested. Mm -hmm. So of course, people invested believe in it, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be invested. <laughs> so it's sort of circular. But um, um, oh, yes. yeah, look, uh, everyone has an opinion. Everyone makes their bets. Um, I'm just saying, if you're looking at a global, you've got $450 trillion in assets in the world, and then you've got $800 billion in, in Bitcoin, it, it's insignificant still. So um, and now, as for the next point, uh, would you like to talk, because we had a comment of, in our last uh, podcast about inverted bond yield. <laughs> um, okay. Would you like to talk about it? Sure, I'll give it a shot. So, is this? Can we mention the guy's name? Yes, yes, he's Harvey. So, hi, Harvey. Uh, this is for you. Um, yeah, you asked about um, uh, inverted yield curves and whether they were predictive of recessions. I assume you wanted to just get some perspective on our opinion about that, uh, which is fine. I mean, it's not a, it's not a. I'm not a specialist in bonds, but I can give this a shot. So. So what you have here, guys, is what you'd call an inverted yield curve. So on the, um, is it the, the, what's the vertical axis? Is that the x-axis? Uh, this is x and this should okay. be y. So on the y-axis, you have the yield. So higher yield uh, is so at the top and lower yield. And then maturity is obviously the, the length of the bond. So an inverted yield curve will actually um, David, go to the other one. Go to what a normal curve looks like. So the next one. Okay, um, sure. It, it shows. Okay, yeah. this is what a this is what a quote unquote normal. You'll have to enlarge that a bit if you can. I don't know if you can. There you go. So this is what it should look like, David. Like you have the the length of the maturity as that gets longer, the yield increases, right? The the return you get on that bond, right? So if you look at a, a one year bond, you'll typically get maybe 0.1% or something like that. Whereas a 10 okay. year bond, you might get 2%. Okay. So a uh, question to you, David, oh, okay. do you know why, why, why does the longer period pay more yield? Like why would a 10 year pay more than a one year? So just to get it like a longer bond pays a higher mm -hmm. interest rate because the time value of money, right? In other words, okay. they're holding your money for a longer period of time. And there's going to be inflation during, let's say it's 10 years. So looking at the chart here, let's say on the far right, that's a 10 year bond and it's mm -hmm. paying 5%, right? And it's lower if it's a one year bond, they pay 1% because they're holding your money for a longer period of time. They have to mm -hmm. offer you a higher yield. That's, that's the logic, right? Mm-hmm. That's why in normal conditions, a long-term bond will have a higher yield. Okay. 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 Is that clear? Yeah. Um, because of the time value of money and the risk of inflation eroding the purchasing power, you have to offer a higher yield to compensate the seller or rather the buyer to compensate the buyer. Okay. So that's normal. 10 year is 3%. One year is 1% as an average. Okay or just as a normal. So that's what a normal yield curve is supposed to look like in a healthy economy. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at what we're talking about inverted yield curve. 
what you'll see here is it's it's not shaped properly. You can see that very short-term bonds have a high yield higher than the long-term bonds. This is not mm -hmm. normal. This is not supposed to happen. So the question is, what does this mean and why would this happen? Okay. So to answer Harvey, first of all, this is a very rare case. It doesn't usually happen. Inverted yield curves are very rare because they're not logical based on what I just said about how we normally pay more for a longer time period because of the time value of money. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Inverted yield curves are unusual. They're rare and they do typically signal recessions. The reason is what it's saying is that investors are expecting a recession and that the yields will fall in the near term and therefore the price of their bond will rise. Remember that the price of a bond is inverted to the performance of the yield. So mm -hmm. as the yield of a bond falls, the price rises. So investors or traders are predicting a recession by bidding up short-term bonds, if that makes sense. Okay. The market, the market is telling us there's going to be a recession. That's what's happening here. That's yep. why, that's why investors are bidding up short-term bonds to create an inverted yield. This should not be happening. The only reason that would make sense to an investor is they're betting that yields are gonna fall. Yields fall in a recession. So that's the bet they're making. So I hope that answers yeah, Harvey's question. They're front running, that's what you're just saying. They're front running. Yeah, they're, they're saying, well, I'll pay extra now on the price because I think the yield's gonna fall because I'm expecting a recession. And when that happens, yields are gonna fall and the price is gonna go up. I'm gonna make money on the, on the, so on the price. We have yeah. currently inverted yield curve, but it's just like this year. Was it the case the last year as well? Um, it's very unusual. It usually doesn't stay active for very long either. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, I don't have that information. But okay. the bottom line is, yeah. is it's, it's predictive. Well, investors are saying, we're going to have a recession. We think we're going to have a recession. They're predicting And they're that. pricing it in. Yeah. It's, yeah, in a way, it's, it's getting priced behavior. in and it's getting predicted. But the thing is, it usually is only in existence for a short period of time, and then it'll come back to normal. So it's sort of like a I, very short-term uh, event. Yeah. I, I think it's it can be in existence during the scare of recession, because, again, that's what I think. Right. At the moment, we have a scare yeah. of recession. So I don't know if that answers Harvey's question. Harvey, you can you can comment again and ask more if you want some follow up. But sure, that explains, please. Uh, but it does. If if you're asking, does this predict a recession? Well, it says that a lot of market participants, yes, are expecting a recession. It doesn't <laughs> cause a recession, right? Other things cause the recession. This is just like a canary in the coal mine, or we say a warning sign. But it doesn't cause it. It's 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 basically the market saying we think it's going to happen, and it they might be wrong. They might be right. Yeah, we don't know if they're going to be right. That was a, a very, a very detailed and exhausting answer. Thank you, Curtis. <laughs> you were the right guy for this. Exhausting to you I know or exhausting nothing, to me? I, I know nothing about the, the yeah. yields and I mean yeah. the, the bonds and so yeah. I could not answer. It's useful that. to know because if you understand that, you'll understand uh, more about like the Fed and why rates matter and how mm -hmm. the Fed rate impacts interest rates, how the interest rates affect bond yields and how bond yields affect mortgage rates, which mm -hmm. then trigger real estate crashes, which what you're talking about. So it's all connected, right? And the bottom line is what is the cost of money? What is the risk-free cost, right? Yeah. And um, everything else is based on that. All, all other markets will, will take risk against the risk-free rate, right? Yeah. And so anyways, it, we can talk about that, but everything else is based on on this and bo the bond yield is one of the important sort of underpinnings of the market. Okay, so let's move on to the on-chain data. Right. Should okay. Um, and this was also to do with Harvey. Thank you for the, the question or the comments. Um, so we were talking about, um, which maybe go to the exchange chart with the purple line. So um, we looked at this the last few weeks, um, Harvey and everyone, and basically shows the number of coins on exchanges, uh, least reported, right? And the purple line is showing that coins have been leaving exchanges and going off to uh, cold storage or private wallet storage. It's been falling now since October of 19, right? So uh, maybe you have a cursor there, David. October 19, we had 3 million coins. Mm -hmm. right 
Uh, we went back to April 20. We went back to 3 million coins. A April, two, yeah. And then we've been falling steadily ever since. Yeah. So it's been um, almost exactly two years. Okay. And then what I want to point out at the far mm -hmm. right, in the last couple of days, we had another fall off a cliff. Um, now, David's saying some of his data might be different than that. So, however, this, uh, this is from CryptoQuant, by the way. They're mm -hmm. seeing another big drop. It looks like about, I don't know, another 100,000 coins off exchanges. And then in the last two days, so we'll watch that. But um, that the coins are leaving um, exchanges, going to private storage, which suggests they're not for sale or they are illiquid. Mm -hmm. um, Harvey's comment was, well, they can become liquid again. They can come back. Or maybe it's the exchanges themselves that are moving the coins back and forth. So I'd like to answer the idea that maybe it's just the exchanges moving it back and forth. Um, to understand this, you need to take multiple on-chain data points and put them together. You can't just look at one data point because like you said, some of it can be gamed. So we don't wanna look just at this chart. Chart. This chart is one data point. Now let's look at the next data point. Let's look at the next chart about illiquid coins, um, David. So what I would say, Harvey, is you wanna combine the chart we just looked at with another chart and another chart and another chart and try to get several data points that confirm your thesis so um in addition to the idea that coins are leaving exchanges the other on-chain data we can see is where they're going so all bitcoin wallet act activity is visible on the shared open ledger you can mm -hmm. see which wallets are accumulating so this is the second piece of the argument that coins are going to be not sold. Um, you can see here, this, this chart shows 78% uh, of wallets that contain the Bitcoin are illiquid. So the mm -hmm. we know which coins are, which in, are in which wallets and whether those wallets actually spend them or not. So it's actually a very strong amount. It's a very strong data we have on in Bitcoin. Uh, here you're seeing 78% of all Bitcoin is illiquid it's in wallets that typically do not sell at all hmm. and if if the coins are leaving the exchanges and going to these 78 percent of the wallets we can we can guess that those are probably not going to be sold either so yeah. putting these two uh data points together creates a very powerful argument um you can see in the chart you have highly liquid which is 16 percent of coins mm -hmm. And that would be the, the day traders on exchanges, buying, selling, buying, selling. And again, we know which wallets these are. We know which wallets are owned by the Goldman Sachs traders or the whale traders. Can't, and it's only 60%, right? Okay, can't the exchanges fake it is a little bit by, by making new wallets that are illiquid? Fake what? Fake withdrawing, like if it's the coins of exchanges that are being withdrawn, like they maybe can make new wallets that are illiquid and not known on the public ledger, not, not known the, to the public. Hmm? Well, they would be, the, the new wallets would be seen on the, on the Bitcoin map as new wallets. Oh, okay. Okay. So because we know, is that actually you can track, older wallets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You okay. can see how, old, oh, you can see how old the wallet was when it was very opened and you can see the history of the, of the wallet. You can see how often they spent how many coins they have, uh, how often they spend, when they spend, do they sell in a bull market? Do they buy in a bear market? Do they just stay? How long have the coins been there? So you can see wallets. We know that the Satoshi Nakamoto wallet is has been there since the beginning and it has a million coins and those million coins have never left. So we know, yeah, never we know the wallet, how old it is and what's happened. So if these so, wallets are older, yeah. then it's actually very good news. Yeah. Yeah. That so right. if 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 the exchanges were to put a, a fresh wallet and start just moving coins in and out, you could see how old the wallet was and you could see how long the coins had been there by their UTXO. Because remember, we can see the history of the coin. So you can't fake it, in my opinion. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that that data is accurate. Okay. Interesting. Um, so look at the 6% liquid that's somewhere in between the highly liquid illiquid the 6% is people that sometimes or it's wallets that sometimes sell sometimes don't right or they sell a bit they might sell let's say they have 10 coins 
they sell two coins and then they buy them back and then they sell three and buy them back. So they're somewhat in the middle. Um, yep. So if you combine if you combine this wallet knowledge with the exchange knowledge, you can see which coins are going to cold storage. And we have the data that the coins that are going to cold storage are being added to other large holdings that were not sold. The behavior of that wallet is to not sell. I hope mm -hmm. that's clear. Yeah. So we have several layers to the on-chain data is what I'm trying to say there. And um, some of it can be gamed. Look, there's OTC market. There's there's There are games that whales play, other people play, but they can't. Mm -hmm. They can't game the whole thing. Does that make sense? They're on the edge. Uh, but um, there are some things uh, you cannot fake, and that's what the blockchains are about, right? Right. You can't. You can't fake some it on net, fake. right? You can't yeah. fake the seventy-eight percent. Maybe. Maybe there's two percent here that that's that's uh, uh, some some a whale's doing something tricky, but not seventy-eight percent. So mm -hmm. so we we know. Um, you know, we know the guys that have been holding since 2012 or 2010 or 2008, or we know the people holding pre-2017 and they haven't moved their coins. So we know those are diamond hands. We know Michael Saylor's wallets. We know mm -hmm. when he buys, you can see because he reports it. So you yeah. can see whether he's holding or not. He's holding, mm -hmm. right? And you can also see who's selling, who is highly liquid and who's buying and selling and buying and selling. And we can see that. And so there's a lot of very rich uh, data there. Yeah, so certainly. Um, anyways, I'll, that's enough on that. So I think we've covered everything that we wanted for now. Uh, we've been on for almost an hour. Is there anything else you want to add? Any other topic you want to touch? Uh, for me, no, just I, I was watching Raul Paul uh, talk mm -hmm. about Russia, Ukraine, and he had a really great video talking about we don't know the network effect that this is going to cause and he may have also under underestimated um i think a lot of people are thinking okay when the war ends in a couple mm -hmm. weeks there's going to be a peace treaty and mm -hmm. the stock market's going but, to recover and bitcoin's going to recover and we're back to normal but well, for, first um, of all we have to see what kind of a peace treaty that is because we don't yet know nobody yet knows yes uh, what exactly is that gonna come. But, but let's say even the perfect peace treaty, let's say Putin um, just says, look, we're not going to kill anyone more and we're going to we want a few territories, but we're going to pull back and uh, Ukraine agrees it's going to demilitarize. It's not going to happen, mm -hmm. but let's say they did the perfect scenario. Even with that, you'd have to say, is the West going to stop sanctioning Russia? No. Is the West going to let Russia sell its oil in the same way? No. Um, will the Ukraine still be threatened? Yes. Uh, will the commodities in that area be under threat? Yes. So you're going to have knock-on effects, even if the war ended tomorrow. Well, but some right? uh, sanctions would be lifted in that case. Okay. If the peace uh, treaty is really, really good, then some uh, will be lifted. It could be. It could be. So you think the West is going to just say, "Oh, Putin's not so bad anymore. Let's keep him in in all these agreements. Let's let's no. start buying their oil again." Now they may have to, but I think. The brand is damaged, to. right? Right. So there is anyways. some damage already done, but yeah. uh, we still first have to see how the conflict is gonna unravel. Whether there yeah. are good, whether there are any more nasty surprises. Right. If there are, like we've said, if there are nasty surprises, we will then retest the thirty case. Right. Yeah. And, but yeah. So you asked me what were my comments. Uh, okay. That would. That's what I would wrap up with. That I'm realizing mm -hmm. just listening to these other smarter people's people smarter than me, that there there could be, again, it could be two, three, five, ten years of impacts from some of this. Who knows? Nice. It's not it, just because the war stops tomorrow. I think we've sort of crossed a line with Russia in terms of its relationship and trade. And you may not be able to pull that back. Well, certainly um, it's not going to be easy. That's for sure. OK, so thank you very much, Curtis. And uh, I will yeah. see you again. And thank you, everybody. And have a relatively peaceful weeks. Great, thank you.